You are about to listen to Upon the Rock broadcast with Pastor Lauren Shakir of Foundation of the World Church. It is our prayer that each teaching will help build a godly foundation in your life. Please be sure to visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for further information about this ministry and to view more teachings. Now, here is today's message. Say it with me, faith in the Word of God. All right, so I think that's, you know, pretty good to to know that you got to have faith in the Word of God because without faith, without the Word of God, actually you can't have faith, right? You cannot. So we have to make sure that our faith is grounded in the Word of God. Turn four down a bit. I'm sorry, got a little feedback. Trying to get the sound to be perfect. That's good right there. All right. So faith in the word of God. Let me jump right into it because I don't want to take a lot of you all's time. And I think this is a good message to just kind of just not just keep in your pocket, but to be reminded of. Because sometimes if you're not careful, you can get off the word of God. Right. In our Christian lifestyle, we sometimes just kind of get away from the word of God. And we wonder why our faith is not working the way it's supposed to. Because our the word of God, we don't have no word in us. Therefore, we have no faith. And without faith, what? It's impossible to please God, right? Because he who believes in God must first believe that he is and that he's a reward for those who diligently seek him. But if you're not grounded in the word, you have a false faith. And so you come up with a lot of different terms that we use and we call it faith but it's not faith because it's not rooted in the word of God y'all hear me so let's jump into the scripture because as you know I got a lot of scriptures but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna choke y'all today but it's enough so what I have right here is in Romans chapter 10 we all know this one so then faith comes what by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're going to say it again. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. One more time. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So even the words that I'm saying now, your faith tank is rising. When you just sit around people who are word based, your faith tank is getting increased. Now, when I say increased, I don't mean that he's giving you more faith. Because you have the measure of faith, right? But your faith is more pure. It takes out the doubt, takes out the unbelief, takes out everything that's blocking your faith from flowing. And that comes through the Word of God. Would you all agree with that? So the more I'm around the Word of God, my faith is being purged from everything that's hindering the faith from moving in my life. So then it goes and says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, And we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, these preachers were talking about to this city that they were were preaching to, that was Paul. You accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is, what? The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who do what? Believe. So the word of God will work in the people who actually believe it. Selah. You can't just quote the word, but if you don't believe it, it sounds good. I mean, you can quote scriptures on our on our social medias. We can post scriptures, but do you believe that word? Because if you don't believe the word, it ain't gonna work for you. I mean, you're making you're saying the right things and you're making a lot of noise, but it's not gonna work for you because you don't believe it. So the Bible talks about these words that we have. It's not human words. These are actually the words of God. So it doesn't matter who wrote it. Yeah. It doesn't matter the person who wrote it if it was the word of God. Am I right about it? Why do you say that, Pastor? Because people get inside of all kinds of stuff. Or who wrote it? What color were they when they wrote it? Oh, my goodness. We got to deal with that spirit. So it says, you didn't receive it from human words. I mean, these were not human words. These were 
words from God, no matter who the vessel it was, or as we poured out, it doesn't matter what the vessel is. Did you did, did it get poured out? The anointing get poured out? See how we all be working together when we be all in the sun. But look, as it actually is, go back to that real quick. It says, but as it actually is the word of God. So if you take the word of God by the word of God, it will produce the fruit from the word of God for those who believe. Am I getting a little too deep on you all? Because I think if we get away from the word, we can be in a spirit of error thinking that, oh, I'm good, I'm good. But th there's no faith. And there's no word of God. So if you're not rooted and grounded in the word, you're not going to produce the things that God tell you. Right? All right. So that means either the word of God is true or the word of God is false. Right? Jesus said that in St. John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. And behold, uh, the power, I forgot it, but then he says, all who believed on him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God, right? But notice how it said, the word became flesh. So in other words, Jesus, when he walked around, he was the word of God in flesh, right? So we know this, right? So if you don't accept Jesus, you don't receive the word. I'm going to go a little deeper into that, but look at this scripture right here, because I love this part. John chapter 18, when Pilate's about to, when Jesus is about to get crucified by Pilate, I love this, this scenario right here. Verse 37, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason why I was born, I came into the world to testify to the truth. So in other words, the word of God became flesh and it is the truth, right? Anyone who sides of the truth listens to me. And I love this part where Pilate says, what is truth? That's what the world is asking. What is truth? Responded Pilate. Now, Pilate is a strong, high-ranking government official. And he's asking, what is truth? That is the reflection of the culture. They're all looking for truth. And you know what they call it? Your truth. That's your truth. But you know what? There's only one truth. It's only one truth. So anything that's like your truth, you know they own something then. That's the spirit of a lie then. Because it's either the truth or, or the lie. So if it's your truth and it's not the truth, and if it's your truth, then by default, it's the lie. And you are believing a lie anytime. That's why I get real anxious when I hear people say your truth. I'm like, oh Lord, what kind of spirit you got? And sometimes people are just trying to keep up with the culture. But you can't just say, as a, as a child of God, you can't just say everything that's popular. I'm sorry. I know I sounds a little legalistic, looking for a demon under every rock. But you know what? Sometimes you got to get fanatical because you can't just keep up with the culture and say that I am with the truth because the world is with the lie. And everybody, the Bible talks about, and I'm not, I didn't say it in my notes, but he talks about how um, though people love darkness, so they stay in darkness, Romans chapter 1. And so they don't want the truth. They want the lie. And they, will, they, will call, they won't call it a lie. They'll call it the truth so much just so they don't have to submit to the truth. So I'm not going to spend too much on that, but I love that, that situation because that's what the world is saying right now. What is the truth? And Jesus said, I was born. I am the word. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. So anything outside of the word of God if it goes against the word, it's the spirit of the of a lie or the lie. Are y'all listening to me? And Satan is the what? Father of lies. So I just want you all to recognize that whatever God, all the promises of God are yes and amen. If you find it in the Bible, you know the Bible talks about, I'm flowing now, um, Luke chapter 4. He talks about that he stood up in the temple to read and he found himself in the scripture and said, the spirit of God is on me and he caused me to preach the gospel to the poor. Y'all remember that? Jesus found himself in the scripture. So whatever the Bible says about our lives, if we find ourselves in the scripture, we can have faith in that. Y'all hear me? So if you find yourself in the scripture, that means you don't, no matter what it looks like, 
If you find yourself that God called you to be this and all the promises of God are yes and amen and the Bible said that these promises cannot be broken, the scripture cannot be broken. If that is the case, then we need to have faith in the word of God, right? All right. I don't want to talk y'all ear off, but I'm trying to set you all up like a lawyer. I got to build my case a little bit. So that's why I kind of sometimes ramble because I know where I'm going. So in one scripture, for an example, was in Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5. This scripture was prophesied about a forerunner of Jesus. Now, we know who the forerunner is, right? But look at verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the, of the deaf shall be unstopped. Verse 6. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall sing. For the water shall burst forth. Everybody say burst forth. Shall burst forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. So that is a messianic scripture. Not so much talking about... Uh, yeah, it is talking about Jesus. But it was talking about... If you read a little bit more before that, it's talking about this will happen when you see the anointed one. These are some of the signs. So John the Baptist was a person who was a forerunner. And real quick, I'm just going to give you a little biblical history on that. You all know about John the Baptist's ministry, right? He was very unapologetic, right? He got thrown in jail because he was speaking truth to power, right? He said something to the culture that got him thrown in Facebook jail. I mean, thrown in jail. He got thrown in jail because he was just preaching the word, right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to come to him, but I'm just saying, he got thrown in jail just by preaching the unadulterated word of God. And he was very unapologetic. He was a little weird, eating all that camels. I mean, wearing that camel's fur and got that locust and honey and everything. I mean, he got locust legs sticking out of him because, he got, you know, but anyway, he looked a little weird. And sometimes a lot of us as preachers, they don't look like you think they should look. They look, they kind of a little weird. And when you, and when you start, people, the world will start persecuting people who actually really carry the word of God. Like you were just talking about the little bit in your head. They will come after people who actually got substance. If you ain't got substance, you ain't no threat. You ain't no threat. But the moment you stand up and you start really pouring out the anointing, they're like, okay, we need to get that one. So that's what happened with John. John was in jail. He got, he was baptizing Jesus, baptized all these people, and he was telling tax collectors, he was telling soldiers, he was telling all kinds of people the way to get to heaven. He says, I, you know, I've come to make the crooked path straight, the rough places plain. And for his trouble, he got thrown in jail. And so he's sitting in jail. I mean, I want you to kind of just think about where John is at. He's sitting in jail, and he said, I did all this work for the kingdom. And look at where it got me. And he said, um, did, I, did I do it right? Am I talking to anybody? You up there serving God, you don't see the victory that you think you should see. And you sometimes think, did I miss it? I mean, if we be honest, I prayed, Lord, I did what I believe you thought I told me to do. Now I'm up here in jail. Well, now I'm up here and my family don't want to talk to me. Now I'm up here, I don't have what I thought I should have. Did I miss it somewhere along the way? And what happens is all that faith that John the Baptist had start to be contaminated with doubt, fear, unbelief, and worry. Are y'all hearing me? And all of us get there. Thank God that John, if John the Baptist can get like that, that means, okay, it's okay a little bit for us to kind of, I'm not saying that you endorse the doubt. I'm just saying that it's not uncommon, right? So in Luke chapter 7, he sent them, he sent his, some of his own disciples, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who's to come or should we expect someone else? Now, this, this guy baptized Jesus. He saw the dove come down, right? But look at the words, verse 20. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Verse 21. Everybody say these four words, at that time. Say it again, at that time. Okay, now watch this. At that time, Jesus cured many of those who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave them sight to many blind, many who were blind. Let's pause right there. So here's how it looked like. They came to Jesus, he got this crowd, and they said, oh, John the Baptist asked us to tell, ask you, 
uh, are you the guy that we've been really praying for? And Jesus said, he said, what now? He said, are, are you the guy that we've been praying for? And Jesus said, hold on one second. And then he healed, touched this person, person got healed. He said, no, what would you say now? He said, are you the guy who are we praying? He said, wait, wait one second. And then he cast out a devil and the devil said, you are the son of God. He said, okay, now what would you say now? And then they said, we just want to know, are you the guy who we've been waiting on? And then Jesus didn't even answer him. Look at verse 22. He replied to this message. He didn't even say yes or no. He replied to the message. He said, go back <laughs> and report to John what you have, what, seen and heard. Watch this. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. He's, he's quoting Isaiah 35. He, uh, leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. And watch this. The dead are raised. Now, that wasn't in Isaiah 35, but he said, I just added a bonus. The dead are raised. And then the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And then, you know, it's Paul right there. So he says, basically, I'm not going to tell you who I am. I want you to go back and see. I want you to see what you just saw. Go back and tell them what you just saw. And then the dead are raised, even though, because John the Baptist had to find himself in the scriptures. Isaiah 35 was talking about him, that he's going to be that forerunner. So when he saw the scripture being fulfilled, he didn't need some booming voice from God. He just had to go to the word. Y'all hear me? So they walked away in verse 20, what is that, 23? Then he said, and tell him, bless is anyone who was not offended on the account of me. Make sure you tell him that, right? Don't forget that part. And think about it. He says, I mean, because think about it. When, when you are in doubt, you actually can be offended at God. It didn't show up the way you thought it was. And then all of a sudden, the Lord says, everything you saw in the scripture is actually happening, but don't you get offended by the word. Now that right there can preach. I'm not going to go there, but don't you get offended by the word. Why? Because you could be living your life and the word of God says that's wrong and you're going to have to change your whole life because the word of God. Not because you feel like changing. Because they walked around, they had to walk back and tell him, and on the last part he said, and tell him, don't, don't get offended at me. Don't get offended at the word. When you start seeing the word start to come out, and you start seeing the word of God, that God is going this direction, don't you get offended. Because you're either on my side, or you're not on my side. And so, uh, they walked around the corner, they, they left, and, and Jesus kind of watched them leave. And I love this part, because in verse, the next verse, after they walked around the corner, after John's messengers left, the Bible says Jesus began speaking to the crowd about him, saying, what kind, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? I can read all of this. I might as well, since we're in Bible study. Verse 25. If not, what did you go to see? A man dressed in clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes are in the palaces. Verse 26. But what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. More than a prophet. He is, this is the one who was written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, prepare the way before you go. And, and I tell you, those who were born among women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. I can spend time on that, but I'm not. But look at what just happened. So after the messengers left, the Lord said, are they gone yet? Hey, y'all know about John? He's the greatest prophet ever. He's better than Moses, Elijah, all these people. And somebody said, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt Jesus. How come you didn't tell them that? Why are you telling us this? How come you, those messengers asked, I mean, wouldn't it be great? I mean, Jesus is up here endorsing John the Baptist's ministry. And the messengers just asked, hey, John, is kind of, he's going through a rough patch. Is there any word from the Lord? And he just said, go back and tell him to read that scripture. What? Then when they left, he talks about he's the greatest guy ever. And it's almost like that's how faith is. You can, you say, Lord, I'm going through this thing. And you try to just open the Bible and see what happens, right? And the Lord reminds you of a certain scripture that you need to go back and study. Yes, you want somebody to come. Thank God we have prophetic people. You want somebody to come and lay hands on you and speak a word of knowledge. But guess what? You may not get that. You may not. So you can't go in there talking about, Lord, I need a word. You go down to that line and they walk right past you. <laughs> and they got a, a word for somebody else. You know what that means? Go back to the word from where you heard. Because what happens is you're at a certain point of your life where you can't be swayed by the fluff. You can't. 
you're at such a point, you got such a foundation that you got to just have your faith in the word of God. So God will shut up every single prophetic voice, every single gifted minister, because he wants you to get back into the word. Are y'all hearing me? The word of God is all the prophetic words you need. I know that sounds a little bit too much like, oh, okay, Pastor, but I want the rhema word. I want, you know, but you know what? You need to make sure that the word of God is your best friend so you can recognize. So, again, thank God for the gifts, but if you don't have faith in the word of God, what, what, is, what good is it going to do? So after they left, Jesus started blowing up John the Baptist's ministry. And I'm like, man, that would have been really good if he would have told them that. That would have really encouraged John. But the Lord knows what really is going to really encourage John is if he just reminded of the word. Isaiah chapter 35, he says. Read that scripture. Everything that you study, John, is happening. The dead are raised. And then he says, I shouldn't get offended. So when the word comes, I need to kind of just adjust my life instead of trying to adjust the word. Are y'all hearing me? So the Lord speaks highly of you. And that means that if the Lord speaks highly of you, you can't pick and choose what kind of word that you want to receive. Lord says, say that again. Okay. You cannot pick which word of God that you want to receive. Did it hit your heart yet? Because we live in a culture. We only want to have words that we receive. And the Bible says the word is a double-edged sword, right? Two-edged sword, which means it will cut you both ways. It'll cut you, the one that's holding, and it'll cut somebody else. So whether you're a preacher, that word will cut you too. I know you're up there preaching to everybody else, but the word of God will cut you in half. If you're not living according to the word of God, it will cut you. And we can't, again, we can't pick and choose what scriptures we're going to kind of remember or we're going to kind of use. You know, you, we, we kind of throw the scriptures at certain people when they get off track, right? We beat them over the head with the Bible, right? We mortal combat uppercut them in Jesus' name. Because we want to let them know that we got the word of God and you are off and you are in sin. And so people, when they come, you know, hard like that, they probably need to eat humility some humble pie, but they only are, sometimes they're a little bit too extreme. They're top heavy on one side, but let that thing spill over to the other side. Let's see how much they have. So it's a double-edged sword. I was thinking this week about the double-edged sword because, um, yeah, it was this week. I was sitting outside on the patio and I was just kind of just listening to the birds sing and watching the squirrels dance and everything. So I was sitting there in the backyard kind of meditating and then the Facebook thing kind of blew up a little bit right? it was this picture it was this picture of um, now listen we're done with elections so y'all give me some slack a little bit alright I'm gonna go a little political but just I'm, I'm making a point so don't I know y'all ain't but y'all over there they know who I'm talking to give me some slack because I'm about to say something and it's nothing to do with political things. It's just that the heart, the spirit behind it, you got to make sure you have the right spirit. So they had this picture of Donald Trump. And they had these evangelicals praying over this golden statue. And they went off. I mean, off, off. Turn it off a little bit. They was ripping their garments. They were throwing dust on their heads. They were wailing loud in the streets. Look at this. And they were quoting this script right there in Exodus 20, making a graven image and everything. They are praying. These evangelicals. And here they go. These white evangelicals praying over this man. Look at them. And they were throwing every single stone you could think of. Right? And so um, I looked at that and, you know, Jensen's back there. I know Jensen's character. And I'm like, I remember this picture somewhere. And I just Googled. All I did was Google. I just, yeah, I, I Googled and, and go ahead and push that. And this is what I found. Like, oh. So something was Photoshopped. 
So you know what I did? I didn't get back on Facebook and say, ha, look at y'all. No, all I did is repost the truth picture. No words. Why? Because a picture is worth a thousand words. So I just post the picture. And all the people that was wailing loud and throwing dust and ripping their garments, they saw the picture and they said, oh. A lot of them didn't apologize. Oh, Lord, you out there. Now, I might as well say, y'all didn't apologize. <laughs> no, you didn't. You just kind of said, well, I still think it's. And I'm like, okay. So some people, they just want what they want. The word of God is there, and they're like, I just want that. But then when it turns out it's the truth, they're like, well, uh. Uh, and they try to spin it. They're going to try to spin it so that they can always seem like they're right. Because some people with egos, they don't want to be told that they're wrong. So instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, y'all. I put out this fake picture of these white evangelicals. Instead of saying that, I apologize. This was wrong. You know, no, they just kind of just try to spin it. Because they just want to see in their mind, I'm about to go there. In their mind, they think the white evangelicals are the enemy. I don't care if they have the word of God. They are the enemy. And this is how Satan is going to get the church, through that spirit of hate. They don't care what color the vessel is, God will pour out from anybody who's available, whether they're white, brown, whatever. And so I just post a picture up there, right? And that's all I did. And, you know, a little bit, some of them came for me a little bit because I posted the truth, but I didn't respond. You don't need to. And then four days later, if I say four days later. Look at what I saw. I mean, I, you, you know, I am just so proud of you, you know, being just an amazing role model and embracing your truth. I'm sorry. That's Dwayne Wade's son that's living as a girl. Let's play that again. I mean, I, you, you know, I am just so proud of you, you know, being just an amazing role model and embracing your truth, right? Um, you're 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 already doing this, so maybe this is for some other young people that are listening. Um, I feel. But let me just say, it, it it does take time to know what your self is, you know, for young people. So I, my first piece of advice is be patient with yourself. You know, number one, um, you know, at your age or in the teenage years and probably through your 20s, you're going to be experimenting with so many versions of yourself, right? All young people are trying on different versions, different voices. They're, they're learning more about their intellect. They're learning about what they love, what they're good at, what they like. This is the period of exploration. Right. And sometimes we put too much pressure on teenagers to know who you, you're going to be. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. That's what I write. It was a question that I hated. It's like, how am I supposed to? I'm 13. I'm 12. You're not supposed to know yet. You're not supposed to know yet. Oh, y'all caught that. Yeah. Okay. So, so, go ahead and put that up for a second again. So, we get this, you know, former first lady. Got all this clout. <laughs> Got all this clout. I mean, I mean, it's truth, right? But, you, you know, where is the outcry on that? I'm just saying, if the sword cuts both ways and you were ripping your garments over something that was fake, well, here's something that is real. And it's, you know, pushing an anti- uh, God gender that's, that's gender to, I, I mean so many terms now I can't even keep up but what does the word of God say about that like that guy Will Smith up there. What, I mean, what does it say about that how come nobody is wailing in the street about that you know why you know why because they want it they want it I'm gonna calm down they want it the white evangelicals to be the devil. But what if the same person is your color skin and they're saying something opposite of the word of God? You got to choose this day.
who you're going to serve. Because if Satan knows that's all it takes to get the church involved, all he got to do is just get somebody to get clout that get the same color as you and put his words in their mouth and you will swallow it. The word of God is a two-edged sword. If you're going to cut that way with that golden fake statue, then you got to cut this way when it comes to this. We talking about equality or equal opportunity. Listen, if the word's going to cut that way and that was a fake picture, then it ought to cut this way just as much. So I'm just saying, if the word of God is, I mean, that powerful, and then you're going to say you're a, well, you can't be talking about that. Those are the Obamas. That's, they, gold, gold has come out of their mouth. You can't be saying that because you, listen, listen, I know I'm striking most people's idol, sacred cows. You can't kill a sacred cow all at once. Sometimes you got to kill them little bits at a time. And that's a sacred cow for a lot of us. So they don't want to hear it. And they're gonna probably block me. Facebook probably gonna block me right now. Don't worry, it's on it's on our website. So whatever they say, it's I already got a backup plan. It's on the website. Um, but my point is not political. My point is just how do you cut one way and not cut the other way? And call yourself having faith in the word of God. So I'm proud of you being a role model. What kind of role model? Telling other young kids to come out and cut their man parts off? That is not godly, no matter how you slice it. If that same words were on one of those other people, you will be, I know, right? You'll be pulling your hair out. But because it's on something that you like, we give it a pass. I'm just saying, y'all, if you're going to have faith in the word of God, when you see something that's not a skin issue, but it's a sin issue, then why don't you call out that and be just as vocal? They don't want to see it. They don't want to see it. They want, they want that golden statue. They want the white evangelicals to be the devil or what have you, the Hispanic or the, all of these different things that we put these clicks in. We are all one body and the sheep will know our voice will know his voice he says strangers they will not follow so if, if this person says it's okay for you to be homosexual even though the word says don't because I can go to uh, Leviticus chapter 18 if y'all want to but I'm not going to go there I can go to Romans chapter 1 but y'all don't want to do that but let's just take one scripture look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 very plain and very soft a woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear woman's clothing. Why? For the Lord your God detests anyone who does that. This is just wearing apparel. Imagine if he's saying, you know, you can cut off your man parts or your woman parts. You think if God is going to go ham on clothes, would he go ham on your body parts? Or are we so confused and so in error that we say, oh, God understands? Is God so woke that he understands us now? No, he's on the, he's it. the word of God cannot be broken, right? But we in our culture say, God, uh, it's, it's okay. So if somebody with clout like that says it's okay, and the word of God says it's not, you gotta, you gotta choose this day who you gonna serve. So that's why the word of God will come like this. I'm a little unapologetic, yes, and they may throw me in a Facebook jail. It's okay. They got, I can, I can stay there. But my point is this, that don't you be, don't you start backing down when somebody start bucking against the truth. Does that come out right? Okay, good. When they start going against the truth, you ought to be able to stand up with a strong spine and represent your God. Because the culture, they may come for you, but it's fine. I mean, you might as well come for me. So... You can't just say, okay, I'm only going to believe certain things, but I'm not going to believe other things. Because that's what Peter did in 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to go through this real quick because I, I want you all to kind of see this. I'm going to just read the whole scripture. It says in 1 Peter chapter 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories. That's what some people think the Bible is, the Word of God is. It's just stories written by people. When we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there. Verse 17. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came 
from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. Verse 18, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Verse 19, we also have this prophetic message as something completely reliable. It's not stories, it's completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it. If you want the God kind of life, just listen to the words and obey it. As light shines in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Watch this verse 20. Above all, everybody say above all. In other words, everything I just said was great, but if you're going to remember anything, remember this part. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. It doesn't matter what color they were, who they were, what kind of lifestyle they lived. When that prophecy came out, it came straight from God. He just, he just used that vessel. Verse 21. For the prophecy never had its origin from the human will. But prophets, through human, spoke God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot in that. Um, but basically, he's simply saying is, you need to receive this as the word of God and not as the word of man. If you receive it as the word of man, you're not going to have the right faith in the things of God. He said, we were there. We saw him get transfigured. We saw Moses and Elijah talking with him. We were right there. And we didn't make this stuff up. We wrote this down so that you can have the faith to believe those things. But people, they, they, they always got to shoot holes through the word of God because they're trying to prove, is it really real? All you got to do is have faith in the word of God. All right. I got two more slides. Y'all okay? All right. So the, one of the next things I want to talk about real quick when it comes to faith in the word of God is speak the word of God only. I mean, just speak it. Not just copy somebody, but speak it with authority, right? So speak the word of God only. Verse Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Now when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, verse 6, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Verse 8, I love this. The centurion answered, said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you will come under my roof, but speak the word of God or speak the word only, right? And my servant will be healed. And then he, he goes in on why he said that. For I'm a man under authority, heaven's soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. And the other one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does that. Verse 10, he's basically saying, I know about authority. Yeah, verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found great faith, not even in Israel. So he's basically saying that I'm a guy under authority. I know about just speaking it and things happen. All I want you to do is just say the word. And if you can just say the word, I know it's going to be done. Because I do that myself. I'm a centurion. I've got a hundred men. All I got to do is say the word. And then Jesus says, now that's faith. He's the kind of guy who understands authority. He got that knowledge of authority. And so he says, I haven't found faith like that in Israel, which is the chosen people. I found this among the Gentiles. And he said the same thing about the, the woman who said, my daughter's possessed. She found him, knocked on the door. And he said, you know, it's for the dogs. He said, well, even the dogs eat the, the crumbs. He said, okay, you got great faith. Two times he said, great faith. All you got to do is just say the word. So in other words, when it comes to faith and you're reading these words from the Lord, when you quote, you know, we, we do our confession, people can do confessions and they saying a thousand times the word of God and all of that is good. But do you believe the word of God when you're saying that? Or are you just kind of just, somebody told me to say this a thousand times. You don't have faith in that word. Until that word hits your spirit and it comes out of your mouth, then the word will become flesh. But if you don't have faith in that word, and sometimes you probably do got to keep saying it until the faith tank hits it. I get that. But for the most part, once you believe that you have received and you speak the word of God with authority, you will have what you say according to God's will. So you just speak the word only. Y'all get this? All right. And then uh, my last point right here. I like this teaching. I hope y'all getting something out of this. I like this little teaching. Um, 
the last thing before I go there, I think we need to recognize that all you really need is the Word of God. What I mean by that is you're going to get a lot of things. Help me to say it right, Lord. You're going to get a lot of things that's going to demand your attention to be distracted by something else because the atmosphere or the wrong atmosphere. I'll say it another way. Don't think, okay, don't think that God is not here because of what you see, right? Some people, they're only drawn by the extra to see if God is there. But they ignore the word of God because they're looking for a feeling. They're looking for somebody to dance upside down on the ceiling or something. Yeah, they're looking for all the theatrics. They're looking for the goosebumps, right? They want that, but they will ignore the word. So they'll come in and say, oh, God ain't here because I don't feel him. And I get when they say feeling, but actually, to be honest, if we're going to be honest, can, can I be honest with you all? Those are words from a carnal Christian. It really is. Because you can't feel faith. You have to believe and you have to discern faith. It's a discern. It's a, these things, the spiritual things cannot be felt, the Bible says. You got five senses. But that quote unquote sixth sense, you can't feel it at all. You have to just discern and believe by faith, okay, God is here. But it's not, sometimes it may react on your physical body. Ooh, look at this goosebump. God is here. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not a spider sense. It's not. But people are drawn by what they feel to, to, to recognize if God really there. My point is saying that is you don't need all the extra. You just need the word of God. God will confirm his word. Oh, God don't need any help being God. Now you can feel all day long, but that doesn't mean just because you felt something that God is there or not. You got to believe by faith. So will you believe without the extra? Will you believe without the extra? What if you don't have that goosebump? What if your hair don't stand up? What if, and I'm going to get in trouble with this, but I don't mean this in any kind of disrespectful way. What if you don't, what if you don't see angel feathers flying in the room or golden dust or the Oregon or how all these little things, does that mean God wasn't there? But some people, they're drawn by that. Where the dust at? Where the wings at? There's nothing wrong with that. But you will miss God if you ignore just the word. I mean, people go, they'll flock from city to city. Y'all know it. Y'all know it. We flock, they flock from city to city because I want that encounter. And I get that. You, you know, that's good. But if that is your faith, then you're not going to grow. You are a carnal Christian. And I know that sounds hard because most people today, they go on, they don't even go to a church unless it has a certain thing. Not recognize that God said go to that other church. Well, no, Lord, that church is too small. Lord, that church is this. I'm going to that big church where all the, the glory wings are at. Well, <laughs> you may go there and miss your purpose. I'm just saying. You got to go where, the, where God tells you to go. So, John chapter 20, verse 25. So the other disciples told him. Everybody say told him. In other words, this was the word of God. They told him, we have seen the Lord. After his resurrection, the disciples came. We've seen the Lord. But he said, Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, watch this, I will not believe. I'm going to pause right there. That's how some people's faith is at right there. I'm not going to believe unless I see the organ. Until I see the glow dust, until I see the feathers, until I get an encounter, I'm not going to believe. Nothing wrong with that. But those are for the baby Christians who don't know better. But if you are going to be a student of the word, you've got to be fully led by the word. And if the, the, the other extra stuff happens, then that's great. But what if it doesn't happen? What if it feels dry? God ain't there because I felt dry better make sure the word of God is there that's what I'm trying to say people are drawn by their feelings instead of by the word of God 
So they told Thomas, a guy who walked with him, we've seen the Lord, believe, we've seen the Lord. He said, I will not believe until I see this. I will not believe until I have this. I will not believe until I get this goosebump. If the goosebump don't come, then the Lord ain't there. And that's how they base their Christian life on. And they will be carnal Christians. They will go to, they will, they will go to church to get high. They go just to get a feeling. They don't ever grow. They go from one place, they hop to other place. They got a vagabond spirit because they're looking for something that they're trying to obtain through the flesh and it got to be caught by the spirit. But, you know, people don't want to talk like that because that's boring. We, we got to entertain these people so they can keep on coming. So the spirit ain't there, but somebody jump on that organ. Do something. Put on that show. And sometimes... I get that. Sometimes you want to make sure people are, you know, there. But why don't you just speak the word of God only? Yeah, it may be a little old-fashioned. It may put some people to sleep. But my mentor told me, the word of God will do one of two things. It'll draw you or it'll drive you away. It's going to do one or two. So you can't have no middle ground people. Or we just want to keep some people. No, it's either going to draw the right people or it's going to drive away the people. Whoever, like Apostle Williams tell me, whoever's going to be with you will be with you. Don't be concerned about what it looks like because the ones who are going to be with you, you teach the word of God only, build the quote-unquote church around the word of God, and whoever's there, they're supposed to be there. Everybody else, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't let the door hit you. In, I'm sorry, but y'all can go. All right, I'm almost, I'm done. I'm almost done. Verse 26, let's go there. It says, a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. We call him Doubting Thomas, but he's more skeptical Thomas. Thomas was with them. Uh, Though the doors were locked, Jesus appeared among them and said, Peace be with you. Verse 27. Then he walked straight up to Thomas. Nobody didn't tell me anything. He just walked right up. He saw, I feel all this doubt. Where's all this doubt coming from? Verse 27. When he saw Thomas, he said, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out and your hands and put them in my side. Same thing that Thomas was talking about, right? Stop doubting and believe. Stop contaminating your faith. Just believe the word. Verse 28. Thomas said, oh, my Lord. Now he all weepy-eyed now. Oh, my Lord and my God. Oh, now you want to get spiritual? First you was up there doubting. Now you want to get super spiritual? My Lord, my God. Don't be saying, don't be saying no Christian needs stuff. Verse 29. Then Jesus said, yeah, because you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So because you had this encounter and I appeared to you, now you're going to believe. But what about the people who never had the encounter? All they got is the word of God. They never walked with Jesus. They were never there on the day of Pentecost. They just got the word and asked for salvation and, and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you're more blessed than the people who walked with me because your faith is in something. You caught it by the Spirit. It wasn't no feeling. You just saw the Word of God. The Word was preached. Faith comes by hearing. You caught the Word of God. And even though you didn't walk with me, even though you didn't see me on a mountain, even though you didn't do all of this, you just got the Word and believed only. He said, you have, you are more blessed than the people who had all these big encounters. Nothing wrong with encounters. I had an encounter. Audible voice, God spoke to me. It's not your time. Four words changed my life. And that's great. But the reason why I'm still around, I, I dove into the word of God. Not because some little encounter. Thank God for the encounter. It woke me up a little bit, you know. But the word of God sustained me, kept me anchored. And if I didn't have the word of God, I would not be here today. Because encounters can fly away. So Thomas needed an encounter in order for him to believe. He said, I will not believe unless I see this. I will not believe unless I feel this. And God says, well, the other person who didn't have all of that, they're more blessed than you, Thomas, even though you walk with me. So is your faith in the word of God? That's the question. Are we getting away from the word and we only pick and choose what we want to hear because it's convenient for us in our culture, in the times we live in? Or are we going to just kind of just stay with the word? If we stay with the word, we'll win. You don't have to do anything but just speak the word of God home. Amen. Say faith in the word of God. One more time. Faith in the word of God. Thank you 
for listening to a Palm the Rock broadcast. If you enjoyed this message, please visit the church website at thefoundedworld.org for a free download. Also, please be sure to share this message with your family and friends on social media sites to help spread the word of God. Have a great week.